Hello cave dwellers, today marks the start of something of a mini-series based around refurbishing this 486 PC which was destined for landfill but rescued to be given a new lease of life and you can find out more about the origins of this PC in the video linked in the description. Needless to say cosmetically it needs to be cleaned and refurbished but first we have a selection of upgrades to install to take this from a dumpster PC to my ultimate 486 retro gaming PC. In today's episode we tackle storage, replacing an aging, loud and small IDE hard drive with a compact flash alternative. There are many solutions available for this, but I've gone with this D-Lock model compact flash reader, specifically because it mounts on the rear of the case and allows access to the memory card for easy removal. There seems to be a lot of internal solutions available, but a much smaller selection that allow access to the card like this. And it's a useful feature to have because it allows me to plug it into my computer to transfer files onto it quickly and easily before returning it to the 486. As we'll be working with DOS 6.22, the maximum partition size is 2GB. We'll still be able to make full use of this 4GB card, we just need to split it into two partitions and therefore two drive letters. Another nice feature of this method of course is that you can buy multiple flashcards and have different PC setups per card. Maybe Windows 95 on one, 3.1 on another, Linux or OS2 on another. It really is a very convenient solution. So let's get started by removing that old Connor branded 540 meg IDE disk. It's the only moving part in the PC. And as great as that nostalgic sound of an old hard drive spinning up sounded the first time, it soon became grating after an extended period of use. So once removed, this PC will be virtually silent. The hard drive's housed in a caddy here, so we'll just remove that and uh, pop the caddy back into the case. A second caddy is also present to the rear of the case above the PSU. So natively, this old computer could house two three and a half inch hard disks and three devices in the five and a quarter inch drive bays. The compact flash adapter requires power and will draw the 5 volts required from a 4 pin floppy drive connector. We've removed a blanking plate and we'll just slot the compact flash adapter in on the rear of the case here, nice and close so that the cable can get from the IDE controller to the adapter. Speaking of cables, this PC housed an IDE cable with just one end. I purchased an additional cable to allow for a master and a slave device so that I could install a CD-ROM drive. But I found the new cable didn't fit. If you look at the blue connector here, which is the newer cable, there's a blanked out pin. A pin which is present on the original cable and indeed on the IDE controller in the PC. This is pin 20. It's known as the key pin and it's actually never used. The advice I'm reading is that it's actually safe to drill a hole into that to allow you to plug the cable into the older style connector and it will work fine. However, we're not going to put that to the test in this video. It's something we'll try when we come to install the CD-ROM. Unless, of course, you know otherwise, and if so, please let me know down in the comments section. So for now, we'll use the original cable and get that compact flash adapter plugged in. The adapter relies entirely on the screw and the rear plate to hold it in place, so it's a little bit wobbly. I'm just pinching it under the screw next to it to give it a little bit more support. We can then slot our compact flash card in. This is rated at 40 speed. It should be quick enough for what I need, but I may test faster rated cards in future just to see if it makes much difference. Oh, and if you're thinking 40 speed of what? Compact flash cards actually use the CD-ROM standard for its speed rating, so it's actually 40 times the speed of a single speed CD-ROM drive, or about six megabytes per second, albeit without the slow seek times of a CD-ROM. Here in the BIOS, we can see the drive is correctly detected, but reporting the wrong capacity. That should be fine once we're in DOS and we've partitioned it out into two 2 gig partitions. So let's reach for those old MS-DOS disks, DOS 6.2 on three floppy disks, and uh, part of the installation process detects and formats the drive, which it seems to run through just fine, and then we get some great hints and tips from MS-DOS while it's installing. Now would be a great time to fill out my registration card, apparently. Looking back at the card inside the case, there is an indicator to show disk access flashing here in green, but sadly there's no pin to connect the case light to, so we can't get that flashing HD light on the front of the case. Three disks later and DOS is installed, and after a quick reboot, sure enough it boots correctly into MS-DOS. It seems to be going well so far, 
But to really test it out we need some programs on the Compact Flash Guard. On my daily PC I have this external USB 3 Compact Flash Guard reader. It's as simple as popping the Compact Flash Guard in, plugging it into a USB port and using Windows Explorer to drag and drop files onto it. I've copied demos of Monkey Island, SimCity 2000, a shareware version of Doom and a disk benchmarking utility. It really is a joy being able to pop the card out and transfer files onto it as easily as this. With the card back in it's time to test our first program and of course it's going to be Doom. The installer runs through just fine installing it onto our C partition from the D partition where I copied the files to. And as you can see everything runs perfectly and the game runs smoothly as it should on a DX4100. But most importantly, there's no noticeable slowdown in the disk accessing or the loading times. Likewise SimCity 2000 ran just fine, with loading speeds comparable to the original hard disk I'd say. But let's put that to the test with some benchmarking. I used the Core Disk Performance Test Program for a quick and dirty check. Buffered, sequential and random read tests were carried out. And the results? Buffered, sequential and random read rates at 1928. 1960 and 1943 kilobytes per second respectively. The summary page only shows the buffered rate but it does give you an indication as to how that compares with other machines of the time, placing it below SCSI rates as expected but up there with standard IDE hard disks. And this ties in with how it feels to use the machine, no quicker and no slower than the disk I took out of it. Infinitely more convenient and definitely an upgrade that will stay in this 486 PC for the finished build. If you'd like to see where I take this 486 next, then join me in the next episode where we'll be covering the sound. Upgrading from this... to a combination of Sound Blaster compatible 16-bit sound and general MIDI through a Roland sound canvas. I hope you'll be back to join me. As always if you enjoyed this give me an upvote, subscribe to be informed of future episodes and I look forward to having you back again soon. Take care cave dwellers.